Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Well, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. We have a fantasy author with us today, and it's none other than J.V. Hilliard. J.V., I hope I pronounced that decently. You did. You pronounced it perfectly. Thank you very much for having me today. (laughs) So, J.V., we need to know, before we take off, are you prepared to engage? I was born to engage, just like Jean-Luc Picard, engage. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> Let's do this because we have JV with us today, and I'm just going to read a part of this intro, and, and you, you, he might tell us why in, in, in a few seconds, but JV Hillard was born of steel, fire, and black wind. <laughs> JV Hillard was raised as a highlander in the foothills of a once great mountain chain of the confluence of three mighty rivers that forged his realm's wealth and power for generations. If you want to read more, of course, you know, go to professorgame.com, type JV or JV Hilliard, and you'll definitely find this episode. You'll find the full introduction there and try to decode it yourself if that is of your interest. So JV, is there anything that you want to make sure that we know before we start with our questions? No, I think that you hinted at it. I I tried to make my bio as creative as I could as an epic fantasy (laughs) author. uh, What I did was I encoded my life's history like many do in their bios, but I spun it with a little bit of a fantasy feel to it. So, you know, folks that read it, that know me will know who I am by decoding it. Uh, Those who don't can have some fun trying to find out where I live and, (laughs) you know, what my life is all about by trying to solve the riddles I've given them. But, uh, I see myself as a chronicler of the realm of Warminster, and so I cast myself as as a character within the realm. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic! Sounds great. So, JV, let's let's jump right in to our topics. And the first one is we'd like to know you're probably our first epic fantasy author on the podcast. So we'd like to know what does that look like? What does your life look like? What are you doing these days? What's you know what's what does it feel like to be JV nowadays? Well, you know, that's a great question because it's, it, you know, writing epic fantasy wasn't something that I've been doing my entire life. My day job for many years was as a, a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. I did a lot of huh. uh, defense work and technology work and worked primarily with the Pentagon and various departments and agencies helping new technologies find their way into government hands so that they could provide for the common defense or promote the general welfare. And I used a lot of those experiences, especially the political side of what I needed to do inside this epic fantasy story that I began to write uh, several years ago. And like many authors, I started writing full-time when COVID happened. Uh, there was a lockdown, and I, many of us in my industry in particular really couldn't travel to D.C., and everything became Zoom meetings and, you know, my wife looked at me and kind of wagged her finger and said, you're not going to just sit around for the next year doing nothing <laughs> while we were in lockdown. So I used that time to write a story that I had been writing bits and pieces of over the last 20 years. I'm a, a longtime tabletop role-playing game guy. I've, I've been a Dungeons and Dragons guy, among other role-playing games. And I decided to, to memorialize the best of our D&D campaigns into a story. And that's really where it came from. And in the beginning, it was just sort of this catharsis where it was, I got this out of my system. It was on my bucket list. And, Mm. you know, I handed it to a a professor friend of mine who took a look at it. And she said, you know, this is publishable. And you should really think about, you know, doing this if you if you had it in your in your heart to do so. And I did. So I made a change. And, you know, being an author these days in particular is a full time job. And, uh, you know, whether it's in my case, I, I'm traditionally published through Dragon Moon Press or others that are independent authors, you know, that, that publish on their own, unless you're one of the, you know, you're being published by one of the big five or six publishing houses, you're really out there hustling on, you know, getting your in, invites to conventions and speaking <laughs> engagements like this and, and others promoting your work. So, you know, it became a business and it's something I'm, I've been used to. I've been an entrepreneur for 
over 20 years. And so for me, it was settling into just a, a new type of business and learning the marketplace on the fly. And I'm loving it. So it's, I don't want to think about going back, right? Like this has just been a lot of mm. fun. Yeah. And, and, you know, the energy is different. And you know, I found that my uh, you know, previous career, when you go on an interview like this, you spend two days getting ready for it, right? You, you literally are looking at, you know, at how the, the host is going to look for that gotcha moment or the person that you're sitting across from you is, is going to know what you're going to say and they're going to counter you and how you're going to counter their counter. Here, it's, it's very supportive, <laughs> right? And it's, it's artists supporting other artists and people want to see you be successful and there is no jealousy. It's not a dog eat dog. This is more like lifting people up and that's refreshing. And it's something I hadn't seen for the first part of my career. So I am really enjoying the, the process of, of becoming an author and spreading the word about the realm of Warminster. <laughs> there you go. So thanks for that, that, you know, very insightful way of, of seeing that career change that you had and, and what your life looks like now and how, how it actually changed quite a bit. So JV, we typically are asking our guests about, you know, one time where things, you know, they were, they were using gameful strategies, playful strategies, Dungeons and Dragons, whatever it is that they, they used for maybe some other purpose, like not just entertainment. Um, and how it went wrong. So I don't know if it's some of your your experiences because we essentially, what we do is we want to learn from what they were doing. And, and you have probably a lot of experience in, in world creation and you know being a player in Dungeons & Dragons and other role-playing games. You have a, probably a lot of experience in that. So I don't know if you can pull from any of that and, and find us one of those favorite fails or first attempts in learning. <laughs> yeah, sure. So my, my favorite fail is trying to be a writer the way I used to write. And what I'll, I'll explain it this way. In my previous iterations of my career, I wrote exclusively nonfiction. I wrote every day. So writing from a habitual perspective was always there for me. But the kind of stuff I was writing was policy papers or grants or you know speeches, things like that that you would use for clients or you would use on your own. And there's a total lack of dialogue. There's a total lack of pace. There are things that you have to learn as an author that um, you <laughs> have to be said in a certain way. And so my first effort at this was this 600 plus page diatribe where everything was forced in and rushed. And, and I really didn't know what I was doing. Right. And thankfully, I had a, I mentioned her before, but my my friend, Anne, who is a professor, was able to coach me the right way and tell me, look, you have to shed all of this political stuff, you have to shed your, <laughs> you, you know, and you have to think of it in, as a storyteller. And it struck home because as a dungeon master, as a game player, all the stuff you need to do there, you have to tell a story. And yep. I was writing a story almost in this very sort of objective third person, like it, this, these are the facts and, and here it was. And I had to step back from that and become more descriptive and, and almost tell the story in the way you would tell a story around a campfire, or in my case, tell a story in the way you would around a DD and d table. And there are times as a dungeon master or a game master for that matter, where you're explaining the story and you can see in your player's eyes that they're all connecting with you and they see exactly what you're doing. So I went back and I found times where everybody had the best time playing the game and rolled that in some capacity into the greater story of the Warminster saga. And I broke it up instead of very one very long book, it became four books that are about, you know, 500 pages, maybe, you know, 140,000 words a piece in the saga. We're halfway through the saga uh, right now. And the other two books come out at the end of the year and uh, middle of the spring of next year. I learned that lesson hard. I was writing in a way where I thought, hey, I've been writing for 20 years. I don't need any coaching. And meanwhile, you know, my professor <laughs> hammered me. My development <laughs> editor hammered me. My beta, I didn't even know what a beta reader was <laughs> when I started this stuff. You know, and, uh, you know, my copy editor, one that was most kind to me because I didn't make many mistakes in terms of punctuation and, and spelling and stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, for, but to kind of have to start at square one thinking going in, I'm like, hey, you know what? I... I know what I'm doing. I've been writing stuff. It's in the public domain for 20 years. And it turned out that everything I had learned, I had to unlearn and learn something else. And so 
you know, the, the process of getting book one out took about a year. You know, the process of book two was about a half a year. Now I'm down to three or four months between books. So I'm getting better at it. And, you know, I hope that, you know, people will see that as they continue to read the series. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing. So that is a good story of sort of turning it around. And of course, because you had the support of your, um, I'm not sure if I want to call her editor. I'm not sure what the, the term you, you used was. Yeah, she was a professor who became sort of a, a coach. And a she coach. put me in touch with a development editor who yeah. then let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, punched me right in the face with everything I needed to change. So and it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so you you had that support, definitely. But is there is there anything like is there anything else that you would say like or, or, or how to find that support like that you could perhaps recommend to other people on how to, you know, figure out what they're doing wrong, basically? I, I sure would. I mean, first of all, step one in figuring out what you're doing wrong is admitting that you're doing something wrong, right? You, you, yeah. you, what you're writing is never perfect, especially the first draft. Even though you put your heart and soul into it, you feel like that that manuscript is great. And then it goes through baptism and fire, right? And you share it with people that are going to criticize it. And you have to develop a thick enough skin. And thankfully, I already had. Like in my day job, you know, I deal with enough realism that, you know, for me to, for someone to tell me I need to rewrite something, that's an easy thing, you know, but I think for most authors who might be a little bit more introverted than I am, or afraid to put something out there for, you know, kind of exposing themselves to criticism, you have to understand that those folks are there to constructively criticize, to make your work better. And so their suggestions, even though all of them you don't take, many of them are really good and you should listen to them. And whether it's your fans that are telling you they like certain characters, so you should write about them more. Or, you know, in my case, when you find the right group of beta readers, you know, and what I mean by beta readers are a group of people that are good readers who will often constructive criticism that understand your genre. And in my case, I use a lot of my friends that I play Dungeons and Dragons with. Many of them are also strong writers. They don't do it professionally, but they not only help me there, but they help me if I hit any kind of writer's block. You know, they're there to, to kind of walk me through something creatively and brainstorm with me, which I think also helps. And that makes my group of beta readers pretty unique. But, you know, when you hear from readers and or you hear from fans or you hear from your editors about why they don't understand something, you can't be upset about it. You got to say, all right, well, how do I change this to make it better so that that goes away to make my story a better read for everybody? That sounds amazing. Lots of recommendations there. And, you know, in the end... It could almost be summarized to having something like having your tribe and your group of people that you can count on, right? Exactly right. Just folks around you that you trust, you trust their opinions and are no, they're not, I mean, let's face it. I mean, everybody could share this with their mom and their mom's going to say, <laughs> yeah, this is the greatest thing I've ever read, right? You know, and that's not what you need. What you need is someone who's going to offer you honest criticism and say, well, I don't understand how we got here, or this doesn't connect for me, or there's a there's a plot hole here, or what if this happened? And I think that's the real value you get from people that are honest with you. They're not there to hammer away. They're there to point out things that you can make better. Fantastic. So, JV, you've discussed how you, you know, created sort of your, your process as an author, I'm sure as a, as a dungeon master, a game master as well. You have some processes as well. Maybe, I mean, whichever way you want to go, maybe for the, the game master, maybe for for yourself as an author, as an author, maybe to when you write a, another book, which we hope you you will definitely. Would you say that you have some sort of process? Like, what are the series of steps that you do? Or let's say you're creating a new a new world and, and, and this, as, as a game master, like what are the things that you would sort of get yourself into? What are what, what would be, again, the, maybe the process, the way you structure your ideas? How, how does that work? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways I describe this, and I'll try to be as, as straightforward with it as possible. But when I start planning for a new novel, or in this case, a, a series of novels, I use all of my game master skills as part of that, right? You have to have a good story with nice story arcs and character development and things like that. Because when you're playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons or any other kind of role playing game, the characters are developed by the players, they're not developed by you. You just then wrap the story around the direction they want to take their characters. And, you know, you throw monsters in there and challenges and hopefully they survive and they level up and everybody's happy with the, the way it ends when you get there. When you're writing a story, it's totally different. You're taking a good story, but it's you that's developing these characters. And you have to pace them in a way that you would 
like you're leveling up a you know a character in a game. You know, you're not going to jump from first level to tenth level. You're going to go to second level and third level. And so the characters have got to learn things. They've got to fight through struggles. They have to overcome those things, and that helps when you're developing not just the character but also the realm around them. So I am a planner at heart, and in my business. There are two types of writers typically. There are plotters or planners like me who plot everything to every detail. And I think that comes with mm. me being, you know, a game master. And I have to have all those details ready just in case a character throws a curveball at me and decides to go in a different direction. And then there are those that are belovingly called pantsers. And what, when they say pantser, that means they fly by the seat of their pants. They literally are writing <laughs> and whatever comes out of them just spews into their computer and it's there. And there's advantages to both, right? The advantages to them is they could create a great story and someone can come on your show and say, okay, you know, your character's name is X and here's the plot line, go. And they could sit down and write a story about that. I would freeze up. Like I've got to say, whoa, 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 well, where is this ending? Like, where are we going with this? How do you, I need, and I end up reverse engineering my stories. I literally write the ending and work my way back through the chapters to make sure I don't miss any parts of the story that should be in there. And I whiteboard it like I was in an engineering class. It's, it's so strange. I literally make sure that I don't miss any details, you know, and I tease people. I say, look, there's no empty real estate in my books. If something's in there, it's in there for a reason. And I think I am the, <laughs> the, the quintessential plotter. Like I need to see how this is going and where it's going. So I'll, and I'm going to take you there. And you're going to get a lot of details from that. And I think that's part of, you know, being, you know, someone that has a background as a game master. And, you know, it's been, for me, you want to make sure that you know where you're going and where you want your characters to end up. And so I see those epic battle scenes at the end of every book, or at the end of the series before I see the beginning. And I kind of work back from that. And it's, I know that's a strange process, but it's 100% true. And that works for me. I'm sure it doesn't work for everybody, but that's how I start to plan. And I go through and, and from a world building perspective, you know, I can't use Middle Earth or I can't use Westeros from Game of Thrones. Hmm. Or I can't yeah. use Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms from Dungeons and Dragons. So you have to create your own monsters. You have to create your own spells system and magic. You have to create your own monetary system for that matter. Like, you know, and when you world build, you're doing all of those same things too, because, you know, is the sky blue? Is there a sun and a moon? Is there gravity? Like you have to describe all these things and they don't have to follow the same rules as the world that people live in. I, I you know, I love the fact that my books provide an escapism for people. And, you know, I think that if you change the realm just enough it makes it believable and it allows them to sort of, you know, suspend that disbelief for long enough to read the, the novel and, and get to where you're going without you know, being too complicated and living in a world that they can't envision. Amazing. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure it'll be insightful and useful for many of us creating things that include creating worlds, characters, and so on. So JV, what would you say is something that when creating these things, again, creating worlds, creating a book, wherever you want to go, would be sort of a, a best practice with this thing that you would say, well, you know, this sort of, I don't want to call it quick tip, but that thing that you would say, well, do this and at least your process or your thing will be better than it was before. Yeah. So I've got a few, right? I mean, some of them are really kind of boring, but I'll, I'll talk to them first and I'll get to the real quick tip at the end. The first is at, if you're a writer that's never gone through the process of putting together a book, make sure that writing becomes muscle memory for you. Like it's almost like when you miss the gym, you don't go to the gym that day or for a couple of days and your body lets you know it. You feel like I'm missing something. And you have to be that way when you write too, or to make sure you stay on pace. Now, not every time you sit at your computer, are you going to write war and peace? But you know, at the end of the day, if you're outlining the next chapter or you're doing something to advance the story, no matter how small it is, it will keep you on that pace. It'll keep you coming back every day. And that was something I had to learn in the beginning was that, you know, it, you just can't walk away from it for two weeks. It gets stale and then you're rereading it. And that way, the story that you're putting together, there's there's a flow to it and you feel it and you kind of live it, right? The second part of it, we talked about a little earlier, which is be open to constructive criticism. Make sure that you share it 
and socialize it with other people. I socialize my book covers. I socialize the blurbs on the back of the book covers to see what people think about them because you want to know and you want to have the best cover you've got. You want to have the best blurb. You want When people pick up your book off the bookshelf, You that cover has to pop and they've got to say, wow, I want to take a look at this. And when they turn it over, they're going to read what's in there in 150 words or less. And when you're writing epic fantasy, nothing is 150 words or less. So <laughs> they're usually, I mean, five, 600 page book. So you try to summarize that in 150 words. You know, that's tough. So you got to pick the right words, right? And so I think those are the things that I would focus on to tell any author that they're doing the best tip. Make, sure, make it muscle memory and make sure you're socializing with people that you trust. That's gonna, they're going to give you constructive criticism on your work. Very, very important to receive that feedback, constructive criticism, however you want to call it, engagers. Very, very fundamental. And we've talked about, you know, testing, beta testing, play testing, all of these things plenty of times before. But now you hear it even from a completely different perspective as well. So this might come in as an interesting question for you because, you know, you, again, you come from a different realm. You don't necessarily know some of the guests in the past, but hearing these questions and understanding as well that this is a show about using, you know, strategies from games, gamification, game thinking, all these things in many different ways. Would you say that there is something that you would be interested in hearing in an interview like this one on, on Professor Game, sort of a, a future guest? Yeah. So one of the things I'm doing right now and I'm learning on the fly is I've had a, uh, a video game company license my intellectual property from the series and they're making it into an augmented reality, virtual reality video game that will launch in 2024. But in doing that, they're doing exactly what you just described. They are gamifying the gamification. As goofy as that sounds, and I'll give you a perfect example. What they've done is they've set up a Discord. And in that Discord, they created a game master. And that game master has reached out to a handful of prosumers. And what I mean by that are these are folks that are into blockchain, into NFTs, into crypto, and want to be there to help you build the game. And so as they're building the game, they're testing with an audience of people that are at the higher end of the use of this stuff, right? This is someone that already has an Oculus, or this is someone that's played Pokemon Go on their phone, or, or this is someone that is trading crypto yeah. or buying NFTs and want to be part of this sort of Web3 immersive experience. And this game will be one of the first, if not the first, in that space. So, you know, what I've been part of is standing on the sideline, watching this Discord channel play out and watching folks offering great advice for what they like to see in video games. And what they like to see as part of it, what I found mm -hmm. is they, they want to share. We've had people come in and buy virtual property in a game that doesn't exist yet and give it away to other people to just to get them <laughs> interested, right? Like that doesn't happen. Like I, I, that's what I mean. It's so counterintuitive for me because I come from a world where that never would happen ever, <laughs> you know, and, and here it is. I'm sitting here watching these folks spend their money on a game that's uh, 18 months away and handing it, saying, hey, you know what? This is really cool. I'm going to go on this quest. I'm going to use this rusty key, which is a an NFT that was created where you open it up and it gives you three choices of which doors you go into. And each door, you get a different opportunity and you finish the quest and then you move on to the next thing. And some of these people have been able to help us build what will be, I hope, a much more entertaining game and one that's ready for that Web3 immersive experience where you, when you drop those Oculus glasses on or other glasses on, or when you're playing this thing through augmented reality using your phone, you know, to go and complete your quest in the real world, that's cool stuff. And hmm. I'm watching it unfold. And I think that that gamification experience has opened my eyes to a different community that frankly I, I was unaware of was out there and I'm watching them develop a game around the characters and the plots that I'm putting together in my four novels. And it's just wonderful is the best way I put it. It makes you feel good. Warms the heart. I hope you put us in contact with them <laughs> and see. Uh, I'd be happy to connect, together. connect you with them. Happy to. Amazing. Amazing. So JV, keeping up with that recommendation and of course, right next to your book, would you say that there is any book that you would recommend the engagers, this audience? And of course, why? Sure. So I would recommend a couple of things. First of all, if you love epic fantasy, you start with the best. Go to Tolkien, read The Lord of the Rings, read The Hobbit. He's the granddaddy of them all, right? He's the <laughs> guy. If it weren't for him, there would not be a fantasy genre. More contemporary, 
if you're a fan of games and you like Dungeons and Dragons, I would recommend R.A. Salvatore. He has done an excellent job with the Dritz Duord and the Dark Elf trilogy that was based in the Forgotten Realms sort of setting or Dragonlance by Margaret Weiss. You know, the Dragonlance stuff, I think everybody loves dragons. You see it play out on Game of Thrones and in other places <laughs> like that, too. You can't get away from it. It's almost expected in every every fantasy novel that one writes. You finally find your way to a dragon somewhere, and, and they're just great. On the business side, the stuff that I've learned, I mean, Crossing the Chasm is a book that, you know, I found as is if you're building your business, or in my case, you know, building several businesses, I'm building one around my novels, and I'm also building one around this game that's being put together, you know, understanding the marketplace and getting, you know, in, in the chasm that we're looking at is adoption of a technology to play the game. Like right now, only yeah. the high-end consumer has an Oculus. Only right now ha- have a few people would be able to play this game in the, in the way we want it to play. But five years from now, that's going to be different. You know, Apple drops their glasses or other kind of glasses are going to come out there. You're going to see people walking around in the streets with these things on. In the same way you saw people a few years ago playing Pokemon Go or Harry Potter and catching their (laughs) Pokemons. And at the time, it was like, what are they doing? And then everybody was doing it. There's an adoption to that. And you see that that technology through augmented reality is there. You see it restaurant tables when you hit your QR code. Or, you know, I was at a P.F. Chang's one time and it was the year of the dragon and I bought this dragon drink that was smoky and I used my QR code and this dragon was dancing on my phone around my drink. You know, as goofy as that sounds, <laughs> it's fun and it's experiential and people like it. So, you know, I, I think those on the epic fantasy side, those are the books I would recommend. And then on the business side, Crossing the Chasm. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for that recommendation. And we get to a pretty difficult question, I would say. And it has to do with what would you say? is your favorite game. Oh, that's an easy... Well, I've been talking about it the whole show. It's Dungeons & Dragons, right? So the reason I like it is, even though I am a monster gamer, and, you know, there are plenty of games that I've played since I was a kid, you know, that role-playing game is so immersive. You know, it takes you out, and you can do anything in it. And what's cool about it, it's sort of like this group delusion. Like, we get around... Like, I still, with my friends on holidays, we'll go to holiday parties... And our wives will be looking at us like, what are you guys talking about? And we'll be talking about the experiences that we've had together in these games as if they actually happened and they didn't. You know what I mean? And it's, it's funny. <laughs> and, and it's the same way when you put on that first headset and played Call of Duty or, you know, Fortnite these days where you're making friends you don't know, playing or with them halfway around the world, sometimes with them, sometimes against them. Uh, in these games just to have fun. And I think that stuff is now translating better. So even though it might be a little old school, it, I'd have to go to the old school t- tabletop role-playing game with Dungeons <laughs> & Dragons. It is certainly an amazing game. And I think I've mentioned this once or twice before in the podcast, but I have never done role-playing games and I am looking forward to, <laughs> to doing that in the future for sure. <laughs> well, I'd be more than happy to introduce you to the club if you want in. I'll, I'll get you a character and we can get you rolled up. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. So JV, you know, we're arriving to the end of the interview. I don't know if there's anything you still have you want to get out of your chest during this interview. Any any final words, any piece of advice? And of course, let us know where we can find out more about you, about your book in the world of the internet. Yeah, sure. So the one thing I hadn't talked about that might be of interest to your listeners is I am a publisher of an online magazine called Altered Reality. And if your listeners go to alteredrealitymag.com, what they'll find is a portal for publication for speculative fiction writers and speculative poetry writers. And so you're really looking at things that are fantasy adventure, sci-fi, some horror, some gothic, things like that, speculative in those respects. Uh, even stuff about cryptids and cryptid hunting. Uh, you know, we have an eclectic group of about uh, 70 or 80 authors and poets, along with a handful of artists that do our cover work for it. And if you're looking to find people to connect with, or you're looking to have your first piece of work published, and it falls into one of those categories, hit us up there. And if I could be helpful, I'd love to review your stuff and take a look at it. Because I, at one time, was not a published author. I, hmm. one time, was a lot like those folks looking for that portal por- to publication. And you know, I, I found it through this magazine. I wrote a serial for them as part of this. And then when that owner left... I had the chance to kind of take over the magazine and and sort of rework it a bit. 
in my image, and I'm having a lot of fun doing that. So I offer that to your listeners if they are like me, looking for a way to to get their stuff to publication or just a helping hand <laughs> in that respect. But you're you know kind enough to let me spew this stuff out. So for those that want to contact me or read the Warminster series, my website's really easy. It's jvhilliard.com. You can also find me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram at JV Hilliard Books. And on Facebook and Discord, I am just JV Hilliard. And uh, my stuff is available pretty ubiquitously. You can find it on places like Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or you can, you know, download it on Apple Books. Or if you want to listen to the audio version, you can go to Audible or Rakuten or wherever you get your audio books. And of course, my publisher is Dragon Moon Press. And if you go to dragonmoonpress.com, you'll find my stuff there as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your inspiration, your expertise. However, JV Engagers, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And if you want more interviews with amazing guests like JV Hilliard, then go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started on our email list for free. That way we'll be in direct contact and you'll be the first to know from us if we have any opportunities for you. And of course, remember, as I always like to remind you before you go on to your next mission, remember to please subscribe or follow whatever that looks like on your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.